Welcome to the Town Board meeting, Thursday, June 18, 2015. Please rise and salute the pledge. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The emergency exits are to my right, behind the town clerk, and also the door that we came in. Roll, please. Councilman Delango? Here. Councilwoman Hitzelberger? Here. Councilwoman Doyle? Here. Councilman Prodi is noted as absent, and Supervisor Prodi? Here. Public comment? Sharon, do you have any comment? Sorry? Do you have Public any comment? comment? Public no. comment. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, supervisor's report. At the end of se season, celebration for baseball and softball is on June 20th, 2015, 4 o'clock at Beefman Park, the town of Virginia Ball Field. If it rains at festivities, then we'll be at the Wasaic Firehouse. The Recreation Commission and Sean Howard will be getting estimates for replacement mulch and fabric for the playground equipment at the Wasaic Ballpark. The entrenched weeds, old mulch and fabric will be removed so that new material can be added. The town board has been presented with the 2015 opening day picture of all the baseball players. So we can add that to our collection. Uh, DOT officials met with Stan Whitehead, Pete Sotero, and myself to go over the Community Development Block Grant sidewalks to be repaired on June 8th. Um, I have a letter from the DOT in a response to a request for a speed limit reduction request for Route 22. Dear Mr. Dear Mr. Balkine, this is in reply to your April 15, 2015 letter to this department requesting we evaluate lowering the existing 45 mile per hour speed limit on Route 22 in the town of Amina near Tally Ho Estates. A formal study concerning a reduced speed limit at the above reference location has been completed. The speed limit on this section of roadway was previously reduced to 45 mile per hour. Speed limits are set using the 85th percentile speed unless the physical geometric conditions give some reason to de deviate or accident history shows a pattern that can be mitigated by lowering the speed limit. The study indicates an 85th percentile speed of 51 mile per hour along this flat and tangent section of Route 22 that has eight to 10 foot wide shoulders. We found no adverse physical or geometric conditions that compel us to lower the speed limit. Additionally, our review of the latest accident history found that there is no evidence that the accidents occurring along the section of Route 22 are speed related and would be mitigated by lowering the speed limit. The 85 percentile speed is a speed at or below which 85% of the drivers travel on a given section of roadway. The 85th percentile speed is the nationwide standard at which speed limits are set. The 85th percentile speed is also a direct measure of the influence of roadway geometry, development density, and pedestrian activity on driver behavior for a given location. In most instances, the speed limit based on the 85th percentile reflects the expectations of the largest proportions of drivers, is found to be a safe and comfortable limit, facilitates speed enforcement, and offers the greatest chance of achieving some uniform speed on any given road. When motorists drive at a relatively uniform speed, tailgating, lane changing, and overtaking are reduced. As a result, fewer collisions are likely to occur and safety is enhanced. As a result of our current study, we have determined that a further reduction would not be appropriate on this section of Route 22. We will, however, be adding an additional 45 mile per hour speed limit sign on northbound Route 22 in the area of Tally Ho Estates. We appreciate your interest and thank you for your concern. 
require further information on this request, please contact the Regional Traffic Safety and Mobility Group at 845-437-3396. Um, this is a letter uh, from John Cummins, who's the civil engineer who um, did the study. Would it be helpful to get like a petition signed to send it to them to try again to get the speed limit lowered? I don't think so. It sounds like they did a study. But anybody can do a petition if they so choose. Uh, the Amenia Firemen's Carnival is in full swing, so please go to support this major fundraiser. The parade is tomorrow night and the fireworks are on Saturday. Town Clerk's Report. Good evening. The monthly share has been remitted to the supervisor in the amount of $467.50. Uh, for the advertised position of building inspector one, we've received five applicants and we need to schedule interviews. If we wanna pick a date tonight, that would be great. give blood which is gonna be next but it's gonna be the 24th oh, it's, on the 24th. it's Wednesday oh, we, we were gonna do Wednesday or Thursday okay. they picked the Wednesday I Thursday. have any night starting at 7 30 uh, except for Tuesday for next week I'm available. 24th, is there a planning board meeting on the 24th? Oh, I've got a planning board meeting, you're right. You're right. How about the 25th? 25th will work for me. Let me just double check and make sure. 25th will work for me. Okay, starting at 7.30 in increments of 15, 20 minutes? Yes. Okay. I will call all the applicants and send you the schedule. So this evening, I'd like to present the claims to be paid. They've been reviewed by the town clerk's office. And Nancy emailed the report out and hard copies have been provided. We'll make a motion that we certify that the vouchers on this abstract dated June 18, 2015, and consisting of four pages were audited and allowed in the amounts shown for a total of $60,000, Second. Councilman Delango? Yes. Councilwoman Hitzelberger? Yes. Councilwoman Doyle? Yes. Councilman, Council, uh, Councilman Prodi's going to be noted as absent. Supervisor Prodi? Yes. Okay. And as Councilwoman Doyle has already announced, we're going to have another blood drive here at the Amenia Town Hall. As we requested last month, it's going to be June 24th, beginning at 2 o'clock in the afternoon till 8 p.m. And I'd encourage everyone to come to the town hall and donate blood. And that concludes my report this evening. Yes, we don't have a highway department report. Uh, our county legislator is here. Great, thank you. I'm Michael Kelsey, county legislator. Uh, two topics I wanted to discuss today. Uh, one is to give you an update on what's going on with the jail. Uh, and secondly, the Dutchess uh, Community College uh, budget, which will be uh, we was presented this month in June and we'll be voting on in July. Uh, with the jail, uh, the temporary pods are open. Uh, those, as you recall, were set up modular units to allow inmates uh, that have been housed out in other jails uh, to, to occupy down in Dutchess County. The idea is to speed up the process uh, and also to allow them to have services and be close to family. Uh, and it will result in about a, a million dollar savings uh, per year. Uh, they did open up and gradually they're being filled rather than bringing all the inmates back. It's, it's slowly uh, reaching to their capacity. 
the other element to our criminal justice plan uh, is a program that they're calling uh, Care First. Uh, and this is a concept that uh, I was involved in the early stages with introducing to Dutchess County based upon a model used in Texas, in Bear County. Uh, it's a B E X. AAR or something along that. Uh, and what they found is it's, it's a jail diversion program. And what they found is a lot of people within the jail have a substance abuse or mental illness uh, uh, issue, uh, which we also have in our jail. And what they found is by creating a separate facility for someone that gets uh, uh, detained or has a run-in with the law, uh, you can keep them out of the jail connect them with the appropriate services, uh, and it does result in cost savings as well as uh, keeping some people out of the criminal justice system who perhaps should not. Uh, we presented on this about three years back, uh, and the county executive has bought into it, uh, and it's moving along with an opening date of January of 2016. Uh, now what this is, is the, in Poughkeepsie on uh, North Road is the old, uh, it's currently the mental hygiene building. Uh, and mental hygiene and the health department, as you know, are merging. Uh, their new name will be Community and Behavioral Health. Uh, it'll be one department operating out of the Poughkeepsie J Journal building in Poughkeepsie. The old and you know, existing mental hygiene building on North Road behind, behind uh, Mike Artigas, uh, that will now be the services. There's a clinic there. So already presently there, at Hudson Valley Mental Health operates, as well as will be this Care First facility. And how this will operate is if somebody is having an issue within the community, police are called. A lot of times what would happen is a police officer comes there and there's a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue, the person is high. Uh, they have nowhere to bring them other than the jail or the hospital. They bring them to the hospital, there's a backlog, takes the officer off the street. Now what they'll be able to do is bring them to this care first uh, and they'll in the, drive in the back and it'll be right for ambulances, for police cars, uh, but also people could walk in from the front who are having their own issues. Uh, and this will be a full partnership. Uh, Westchester Medical Regional, which used to be St. Francis, will have staff there. There will be staff from all the various nonprofits from Hudson River Housing to uh, Grace Smith House, domestic violence, Aster dealing with kids, People Incorporated, uh, Mental Health America. They'll, they'll be all the, all the players will be represented. And the person will then get a full health screening. They will have, and that's going to be physical, it's also going to be mental, it's going to be substance abuse. And if they need to be go to detox, there'll be a detox unit there. If they need medication, there'll be prescribers from the hospital that can give them that. And the person will be able to stay there for 23 hours. And during that time, if they need to sober up, if they need counseling, the idea is now you're helping that person, connecting them to whatever services are in the community, and hopefully keeping them out of jail uh, where they normally would go. Uh, so this model, there'll be 16 beds. Uh, around 16, the number could vary, and that will be, there'll be a detox unit, there'll be a mental health unit, which will be clinical, and there will also be what they're calling a two living rooms. And what they mean by living room, will be, there'll be one for adults, and one for youth or for families. So if somebody is coming in with an issue, then they'll have all the different specialties and see where it is. And so this model, uh, which has worked successfully in Texas, will be coming to Dutchess County, it's very progressive. Uh, nobody else in New York, and, and I believe the Northeast is doing it. Uh, so we will see, and hopefully this will result in savings. Uh, and I, I think it'll be a really good model, uh, really addressing some of the issues. So that's moving forward as well. Uh, secondly, unless there's questions. Uh, what kind of savings are you looking at? I mean, is it that they, you only have to house them for 24 hours, you give them this quick uh, analysis detox and then you put it back out on the street again? It, well, it, 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 may, it may be if that's appropriate. If they need services, um, then they can go into different programs. Also, also keep in mind in this existing building, you do have the clinics, but you also have partial hospitalization that the county runs. If the person is in need and they're being observed, if they need full hospitalization, you're going to have the hospital. That yes, that'll, there, it's going to be observed. And right now, if you go to the hospitals, it's about 24 hours before they find a bed anywhere. So it's, it's, it's going to, the hospital sees it'll, it'll free up their 
ER. Uh, and, and these aren't going to be violent offenders. These are going to be people, uh, the classic example is somebody that is loitering and, and uh, there's a gentleman down in Texas who was, who was singing the Our Father and it was a public disturbance or something. It doesn't belong in jail. Um, it, it's, some of the issues are going to be people that, um, you know, could be a homeless person that is in the, in the winter, just really wants to have a roof over his head and right now he goes to jail, but it's not, that's not the appropriate place. But right now we find it and then maybe he goes to a homeless shelter. So it's really going to assess the person um, as far as how much the savings. We don't know. It's diversion. And the idea with diversion is you divert them from the hospital, you divert them from the jail. Um, and right now those are the costliest places for somebody. Um, in the long run we should be able to see savings, but it's going to be difficult to say it's going to be one million or how much it's going to be. Um, I think over time we, we will see savings, uh, but we may not be able you know, here's somebody who would normally go to the jail or the ER, and now we'll see what happens. So, good question. Any, any others? So our best savings is going to be getting them the help they need as yes. opposed to recycling them through the jails and hospitals again and again and again and, and, again, it, and, and it's again. prevention because you're seeing their needs. Obviously, there's some disturbance or something, and, and by giving them the attention they need, whether it's uh, linking them up with the appropriate person, you have that. And you also have helpline, uh, and you have, which the county runs, which is the phone call and you have the mobile response team. So if somebody calls, it's not even the police, and you realize this person needs help, mobile response team can go out, pick them up, well, where do they take them? It's the same thing now. They, there's a place to take them, 23 hours, and you can really assess where's the appropriate place for them, you know, and, and create a plan that the person may not have. So in, in the long run, I, I, it, it's proven successful in Texas. Whether it's successful here it remains to be seen. I think it will be. Uh, there is a lot of uh, um, backlog. You talk to a police officer, you talk to the hospitals. It seems to be a problem. Uh, and it is a progressive idea that's not well tried, um, but I think, it is, I think it's worth trying. Good. OK, second topic is Dutchess Community College. Uh, they presented, they have a new president, and their board came and presented at the June uh, board meeting for the legislature. Uh, their budget, there will be a public hearing at our July board meeting, uh, and in their budget they propose uh, two uh, startling things. One, they want to increase tuition, uh, and the tuition that they're looking at is $240 a year, which would be $120 per semester. The other item is they want to increase the county contribution to the college. Uh, the county has not contributed, has not increased it in seven years. Uh, as you'll know, I've had past issues with this. Uh, it's currently at 10.8 million that we donate. Uh, and with bonds and other expenses, it's, 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 it's high, as high as a little over 15 million that the county taxpayer gives to the college. They, their budget is asking for an additional $1 million from the county. Uh, if you recall, my issues in the past has been that they have a very healthy fund balance. Their fund balance is currently at 15.9% of their operating budget. Normal recommendation is between 5 and 10%. Uh, and they're, they're asking us to contribute and the students to contribute. Uh, and in my opinion, it really should come more from the college fund balance. Uh, once the county increases their share, we can never go back down. It is a maintenance of share law. Uh, in, in the state, so if we're proceeding another million dollars, then that it can never come back down. With that said, there was a number of um, complaints from the legislature, uh, from legislators, uh, regarding l the tuition increase. Uh, the Republican leadership, uh, the chairman and our majority leader, met with the college, and from that, they, they created two possibilities that they're asking the community college board of trustees to adopt and bring back. I'm opposed to both of them. The first recommendation, and I don't know what the board of trustees will do, the first is to lower the tuition increase to 160 a year. Instead of 240, it'd be 160 a year. That's $80 per semester. And in exchange, the county would then donate 1.35 million. That's an increase of, of 350,000. The second proposal is to lower tuition to $120 a year, $60 a semester, and the county would increase the contribution to $1.5 million. As, as I said, I'm opposed to both of those. I'm also I'm opposed to all three plans. I do not believe that the county should be contributing more. I don't want to see tuition up either. Uh, 
But what startles me is in these proposals, there's no discussion of tapping into the college's fund balance. And I think that that is the beginning to any discussion. Uh, so I think there is a problem here and with the community college. I also believe, and I do want to point out this trend, a year ago we were looking at the energy tax. And the energy tax had just been repealed, but we were under its yoke. And the issue with the energy tax was raising money because we had a huge revenue problem. And then it was repealed, but money came in from the state, $5 million for mental health and jail reentry. As I've told you, that money never went for jail reentry or for mental health. It went under and paid for existing programs, and then those, that money got shifted out. And as I predicted, it's been going for salary increases, which we voted for in February and in March uh, and in May uh, for the various unions. Uh, all county employees have gotten raises. What bothers me is it's a tax and spend mentality that we did the energy tax, we're taking money from the state that should benefit the mentally ill and those in the criminal justice system, county labor is ta being taken care of, and now it's been spend, 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 whether it's salaries, community college is asking for more money, and we seem to have more money to know what to do with, where a year ago we were taxing people on fixed incomes. Uh, so it seems to be there's, there's things that are shady going on, uh, and it seems to be a tax and spend mentality. Uh, at this point, I'll be voting no on whatever proposal comes forward with the community college budget. It, it, it appears not. Uh, in February, uh, I think it was February, it might have been January, uh, the, when we were voting on the bond for the, um, the gentleman who had been imprisoned for the, um, all those years, uh, and that was a, about $8 million settlement, uh, I said, where's the money coming from? That's, that equals a tax increase. At that point, the county executive said uh, there will be no property increase next year. Um, so he's on record as saying that this is an election year, and typically election years, they, they zero it, and then the following year you get hit hard uh, because people have short memories. Um, but at this point, they seem to have a lot of money, but it was only last year that everything was so desperate that we had this energy tax. So, so they are going to bond for the 8 million? Oh, yeah, that passed. So I see. That's so yeah. So that was, and that was my point, is there was 8 million. We didn't plan for that. And that's a huge chunk of money. We've had a series of, of bonds throughout this, this spring, as we typically do, you know, where we issue bonds to borrow money for projects from the airport, the auto center. Uh, so it, 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 to me, we, as legislators, we're part-time. There's a budget office and the exec, you know, he handles the budget and we adopt it. Uh, and we only have the information they give us. But it, it, to me, it seems we're spending like there's no tomorrow uh, with a lot of these, and it seems the unions realize that, the college sees an opportunity, oh, there's plenty of money, uh, and it just seems that the legislature right now is rubber stamping everything, even to the point of one million was a high ask, and we're saying, oh no, we'll give you a million and a half. Um, so to me, it, it seems that um, it's election year, they know the budget's gonna be friendly, everyone's gonna, you know, the voters won't be, they'll be fine, they'll forget about the energy tax last, ne last year, and then what about next year? That, It, 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 it's mainly operational. They did settle, I believe, the CSCA contract last year, um, and so the new president didn't, didn't have that burden. Uh, my understanding of why they need the extra money, the new president, I'm sure, has ideas, initiatives. Uh, she specifically said, you know, we want to stay current. Uh, Dutchess Community College is the, still the lowest tuition in the state. It would still be the lowest with the, this plan, uh, but she said that enrollment is down and therefore that's one of the reasons they, they need more money. Enrollment is down during a bad economy, more people go to school, the economy is slowly getting better. Um, that was part of the reason why they have the dorms to try to keep the enrollment. Uh, but it's also, she said, they want to do more of a retention uh, where, and I don't know if I agree with this, um, as legislators, we don't really have a say, but she said she wants to do more interaction from K through 12 to let people know about the community college. And I don't really know if the kindergarten or elementary school is really an appropriate area. I think people do know about the community college, but that's one area she said. Also, the idea of making the courses more readily available to somebody who's working, whether it's online, whether it's night classes, and that sounds uh, like a good idea, but 
I think you really need to look at what is it going to cost to do that. I do think there is some responsibility on the student who's looking to become a you know, get a degree that they're going to have to make some sacrifices in their own life. I don't know exactly how much thought, it's not my role as a legislator, but that those are among the ideas. Also, there's some students that will come for a semester and then don't come back. And there's somebody that they had and there wasn't retention and she wants to focus energy on that, which is appropriate, but at what cost? You know, there could be, someone could have flunked out, they might have gone and then, you know, gone somewhere. Who knows what the reasons are? Uh, but the question is, is why, you know, the prices are going up. And as I keep saying, they have a healthy fund balance. Why should our taxpayers pay more? Further questions? Okay, just briefly, uh, if you haven't heard yet, I, I am running for re-election uh, as county legislator. Uh, and, uh, and I do not have any current lines, uh, but, but I do not think that'll be a problem uh, come September. Uh, I will be primarying within the Republican Party, and I have had discussions recently with people in the Democratic Party, uh, and the Conservative Party has also endorsed me, uh, and they have internal turmoil with them as well at this point. So stay tuned on that, but for your knowledge, I uh, have enjoyed representing you, and I do intend to do so in the future. So thank you very much. Highway report. Oh, Stan isn't here this evening. Um, building report. Did you want to do that, Mike? You have town board members, Plean Fine, May's monthly report for the building department. As building permits go, we have issued eight new building permits of $3,414.20 with four renewals, which totals $625. We are continuing with certificates of occupancy searches, and for this month we did three searches, which totals $300. As for fire inspections this month, we did four inspections, which total $800. The total for the month is $5,139.20. Then there's also a memo on here. Dear board members, the Amenia Fire Company has come forward to attain a public gathering permit for the 2014 annual Carnival with Fireworks, and the event is to take place June 17th 2015 through June 20th, 2015. They are requesting that a fee for the gathering permit be waived for this event as it has been in the past. If you should have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Sincerely, Mike Sogokin. I make a motion to waive the uh, fee for the gathering permit for the Amenia Fire Company for the annual carnival. Second. Councilman Delango? Yes. Councilman Hitzelberger? Yes. Councilman Doyle? Yes. And Supervisor Purdy? Yes. Okay, grant report. Um, we were, uh, I thought Mike was going to be here tonight. Apparently, he can't make it. There was uh, some information that he did um, send to us regarding um, the grant that um, he's prepared for Millbrook Tribute Gardens for the kitchen. So we can go ahead and move forward to the next step with that since I got this today. So that's great. Okay. Uh, committee reports. The CAC met uh, last night and had a uh, full agenda. We. Um, We went over um, the natural resource inventory that was last updated in 2012, and we thought we would start with the wetlands section um, and go over that at our next meeting in uh, July, which we haven't yet set the date. Um, it's usually the third Wednesday. We also went over um, Silo Ridge and uh, the uh, everything is posted and up to date. We appreciate that on their uh, website information. Um, it's current if anybody wants to look and see. There are some um, 
responses that we took a look at for their um, waivers that they're requesting for steep slopes? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so this is the CAC report. They went over um, last night the uh, uh, Silo Ridge and some of the information that's been posted. Um, they were responding to the public hearings and the comments. And in particular, we looked at their responses uh, for steep slopes, why it is that they need to uh, be there you know, why they need to build on um, slopes of, of construction to areas of 20% or greater. <clears throat> so that was interesting. Uh, we continue to follow that and we'll report back on our thoughts. Um, we also went over the uh, situation that we're at with the uh, Bufante request for uh, addition of a text uh, text amendment to our uh, OC districts in the town and we reviewed the town's decision to uh, go forward with getting, uh, uh, having our lawyer look at adding that uh, information, that text amendment to our code and um, made sure that everybody understood that that wasn't a blanket as of right if you own that kind of property. There were conditions that would be um, specified, much like our mining district overlay, uh, that would have to be, this criteria would have to be satisfied and that it would be only be um, available with a special use permit. So those would be uh, the controls that would be used to make sure that it wasn't endangering the aquifer, it wasn't um, in a high density residential area that would be incompatible with a, uh, those kind of uses. Um, we did look at the map again and make sure um, it was made clear that there is, that the entire parcel is not appropriate for it, but there is, you know, the forested land, for instance. But all of that can be looked at as, as it comes around and no decision has been made. We just want to make sure that uh, all of the um, conditions are looked at carefully when that comes about. Um, so, just to follow up on that, Vicki, um, we did, because we talked about it at the, I think, we, last meeting or the special meeting, um, there's a link under Quick Links on the town website. It's, it's at the bottom of the page. It says compost information. So everything that we've got that are public documents, um, we're putting there. You just click on that link. It'll take you right to the page. All the stuff's together, whether it's from the ZBA, the CAC, yeah or the town board so and then if you have any questions of course you know you can send them to any member of the board and and we'll try and get a response out because I know that there's a lot of interest about that so that link is available there are documents up there already maps minutes um, stuff like that and then Vicki as soon as you get me the CAC um, minutes we um, do have the minutes at least for the last two months April and May have just been completed and they will be forwarded to you we just received them last night and would great they were approved. so we'll so put that up there as well those are in fact um, prepared um, we also talked about the Wasek trail to the train project uh, because the final uh, design is um, is available now and we reviewed the um, costs that we uh, were included as of May 2014. We realized we're still short by a couple of hundred thousand dollars given all of the grants that we have in, in hand. That's a great help, but still we need to be thinking about um, ways to reduce the cost or you know, find additional um, funding and we did see a couple of items in here and i don't know at what point we would like to maybe have a trail to the train meeting where we could go back over that final design and start taking a look at sure. ways we could reduce the cost we found several items that just seemed like you know thirty thousand dollars in wildflowers um you know maybe we could do something you know less expensive, some grass or something. I don't know, but um, you well, know, we, we can, would love we can, to take a look at these numbers. Yeah, we can meet with um, WSB cells. And that would be set great. That would be great. We did um, want particularly to make sure that we uh, 
talk to them about their response to DEC. They had a number of questions about the wetland, go, you know, our, um, the, tr the trail would be disturbing and going down into the buffered section of the wetland, which is as protected as the wetland, unfortunately, by DEC. And so they had a number of questions and to date that, uh, according to Dave Reagan, our chair, he said he spoke to uh, the woman who wrote the letter in, in 2014 and um, those conditions, the, the questions that she had still had not been answered. So I think we do need to talk to what WSP woman? Cell. Um, it, the letter was dated uh, January 2014, I think. I'll get that for you, but- um, From whom? The letter was from DEC. The woman who wrote uh, the letter, maybe I wrote it down. So Ashley Wilson is her name. Has not had communication since January from cells. Uh, the the what portion? What part of the EC is she from? Uh, I would guess she's from our region, from the New Pulse. But I. Um, I have that letter in here somewhere, and it's in filed as part of I know the final they've, design. Uh, they've uh, worked very closely with um, with Fish and Wildlife and Army Corps of Engineers, and a lot of. Um, but if there's a questions that need to be answered, we should. Yeah. Look so into they're that. very specific. It's about a two-page letter, and she says she just never received their full responses. Is how we're going to mitigate. Um, the wetlands and a, a full discussion, a full response needs to be had, according to Dave, who just spoke to her the other day. Okay. Uh, let me just see what else I have. Um, there, I would just say in general that there is um, a lot of sensitivity right now about noise, excessive noise in uh, high residential areas. We know about Wasaic. I understand uh, uh, Mike Segelkin has taken a look at the um, whatever shooting is going on in the, uh, across from the hamlet. Uh, five complaints were sent out. There continues to be uh, explosive, what is it, targets? Exploding targets that make an additional noise and it's a repetitive, 200 shots uh, were counted in an hour's time. It um, reverberates through the um, uh, through the hamlet. There are apparently illegal structures and uh, clear-cut clearing, and Mike Segelkin is looking into it and uh, is responding, we believe, at this point appropriately. But I'm getting other calls as well um, in different parts of the hamlet. I would just ask everybody to please be aware that it's summertime and people open up their windows and now they hear things that maybe they didn't hear before. So just be courteous about the timing and uh, the level of noise. And um, I think, you know, we have to take a vigilant stand. People have to be able to open their windows and enjoy their property. It's, it's just my personal opinion, but um, hopefully we can, we can respect and um, follow our guidelines in our law. That's all I have. For um, history, it's really not the historian, but the Historical Society sent a whole lot of uh, new information. The photos that David That's right. was talking about, the, the then and now photos, as well as a couple of um, uh, historical accounts. Um, they're all up on their, got them all up on their page on the website, so uh, take a stop by the site and take a look at the, the information. Betsy did a fabulous job with these write-ups. David's photos are fantastic. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy them. Uh, there's a link from the home page to get there. Okay, we have updated transfer of funds resolution by Cedar and Company. Um, I forwarded an email from Linda Hannigan, our CPA, regarding um, that it's not necessary to get board authorization to create new lines in the town's charge account. And 
also recommended taking something out of um, the original resolution number 15 that we had. So based on her recommendations. Well, I did do the resolution as we discussed and uh, voted on uh, at the, our special meeting last week, which I've distributed to everybody, um, which at the beginning of the resolution does define the three new lines and then which has, is unnecessary. and then, which is the way one does it, one creates the line and then you can move money in and out of it no, and then go no ahead and put in the rest of the um, movement of funds underneath it. So I've given that out as the board uh, discussed and requested. Um, so everybody has that copy. Actually, this was sent to CDOR, our CPA, and who went through the resolution that I sent to her and said that it's not necessary to create lines, new lines in the chart of accounts. So the transfer of funds resolution I'm reading is the one recommended by CDOR. Whereas the town board has the authority to transfer funds when necessary and unanticipated to amend the budget. Whereas budget amendment increasing the revenue 3889.1.144 and expense 75104.1 in the amount of 1,164 to record historian grant received in 2014, spent in 2015. Whereas budget amendment increasing revenue 2010.01 and expense 67724.1.87 in the amount of $3,232 to record senior trips portion covered by seniors contribution whereas budget amendment increasing revenue 3820.01 youth aid and expense 71504.1.32 special recreation facilities instructor by $1,200 for the Menia Dance Program grant, whereas budget amendment increasing revenue 3021.01 and expense 11104.1.65 court supplies in the amount of $3,290.90 for court grant received in New York State from New York State. Whereas budget amendment increasing revenue 2189.01 and expense 8989.01. Other home and community in the amount of $15,000 to allocate the recreation funds for the community kitchen. Whereas budget amendment decreasing expense 19004.1.049 contingency and increase expense 13554.1.44 accessor tax juries in the amount of $10,000 for unanticipated outside appraiser and attorney expenses. Now therefore be it resolved the town board authorizes the transfer of necessary budget line to process this transaction. I make that motion. I second it. I do have a question though. Um, for the ten thousand uh, <clears> dollars <throat> that we are taking out of contingency and putting in the tax sartorial line, um, are we going to need to do additional money, or is that is that in it, 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 um, is that going to more or less satisfy yes. our expenses today? Yes. Okay. Supervisor Prodi. Yes. Councilwoman Hitzelberger? No. Councilman Prodi's absent. Councilman Doyle? Yes. Councilman Delango? Yes. Well, it looks like um, I missed something in committees that uh, there was no water committee. It was canceled. Uh, one thing with the water committee. Just wanted to remind, remind people uh, their pressure tests in the fire hydrants. I had a couple calls today about water pressure being low and stuff like that. I talked to Marco and he reminded me that they were doing the pressure tests today and tomorrow. So if your water pressure, you're losing it or anything like that, um, it's because of the testing of the fire hydrants. Zoning Board of Appeals. 
to request a table? Table it to the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Local law for junkyards, Denise, did you want to Yeah, um, I sent out an email regarding uh, fencing provisions and the effect of the local law. There is a state provision about fencing on new junkyards. Um, the local law that was proposed and reviewed, um, the board wanted the fencing provisions removed. That will override the uh, state provisions regarding fencing for new junkyards. There's a separate provision that relates to uh, junkyards within uh, 1,000 feet of certain highways. And I did check with DOT. Route 22 is considered part of the primary highway system. So if the particular you know, junkyard that is in existence is within the thousand feet. It would fall within the provisions of that particular law, and that is something that the local law would not override. So, you know, I didn't get any comments back on the fencing. If you want to leave it the way it is, you know, without including a fencing requirement in the event there were any new junkyards, I think they have to go through the special permit process and site plan approval. Um, it's not an as of right use under your code. Um, but, you know, that would be the one thing, you know, if you're happy with it is without those fencing provisions and the local law overriding the state law, then what we can do is just give that referral to the county planning department to look at to see if they have any comments or input on that. So if we added that provision because this existing uh, junkyard has been in operation, would they have to comply with that new provision of the junkyard law? I think they're going to have a problem under the other state law. They're going to have to put not, it in anyway. Which is not overridden. It's just a matter, I guess, that the state would, or the county perhaps, um, would raise it as an issue. Obviously, they. Apparently, they haven't done so in the past. And I don't know the location if it's within 1,000 feet of Route 22. But that provision is on the books. That part would not be overridden. But, you know, the question would be if um, whether with the local law, if you want to override its general municipal law, Section 136, which applies to a new junkyard. And, you know, I'm just saying, looking towards the future, if at some point someone were to apply uh, for a new junkyard and the board were to consider that. I don't think that our intent was to have another junkyard, that there was, uh, my understanding is that there was no provision, right. as you said, for a new junkyard. Not this as has been right. grandfathered in, so we're regulating it but that there wouldn't be additional ones operating in Amenia. Well, it's not an as of right use, but there is um, provision. There is a way for them to apply. I think it was, I don't have the zoning code with me. I think it was a special permit and they would have to go through, I think, site plan approval with the planning board. In what district though? I mean, it wouldn't be in neighborhoods, uh, high density residentials, right? I wonder what district it would have applied to. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you'd have a commercial area or industrial or something like that where the board might consider it. So that's the only you so know, we can just, question. We can it. just go ahead and... If you're okay with it as it is, then is. we'll just refer it to county planning for some input. And I don't know whether county planning would raise that or not. What's your recommendation? Well, I mean, I, I do see the benefits of fencing around a junkyard for, you know, both aesthetics and safety. It is currently in the state law. Um, so if we don't put it in, the state law would apply? No. If, if you do a local law pertaining to junkyards, then you are overriding that section 136. It does not override 
section 89 of the highway law. Because, um, you know, there's an intention on the part of the state to screen, um, you know, at what may be an unsightly operation from the public highways. So that you cannot override. That's regulated by the State Commissioner of Transportation. So if there was a complaint, for instance, if it was became unsightly and a, somebody could complain to the state and they could, in fact, uh, enforce that law? They could. So that's an option for things. That's within a thousand feet of the nearest edge of the right of way of any interstate or primary highway. Um, and when I spoke to DOT, it wasn't easy to get an answer from them, but finally they did say that Route 22 shows as what they designate as, you know, part of the primary highway system. They use different verbiage, but the person I, the engineer I spoke with felt it was part of the primary highway system. So, you know, in the case of the existing one, if it's within a thousand feet of the nearest edge of the right of way of Route 22, then this would apply. And could potentially be enforced um, without us, without with us changing. leading it, without changing anything. <coughs> right, have. right, because you cannot supersede that particular law. So we can just leave it as is and then move on with the process, right? You can. What your local law is going to do is it's going to override General Municipal Law Section 136, which has the provision um, which applies to new junkyard. So then if we go and change this and put this provision in here, we have to open up a new public hearing and everything else. Yep, redo. But if we leave it as is, we're we still just, protected because we're if somebody- still protected You still have the state law. Yeah, no so we can just leave it as is then? I mean, this, this uh, current state law on new junkyards required an eight foot fence. And then there's, you know, some restrictions on can't be erected nearer than 50 feet from a public highway, which is different from the other one. So, you want to leave it as is? Yeah, because there's an option. If it becomes unsightly or a problem, then a complaint could be made and the state could take care of it. Okay. Hey, uh, we have an open bookkeeper position. Our bookkeeper left a, the town of Amenia part-time position to take a full-time position in the village of Rhinebeck. So I would like to uh, make a motion to authorize the town clerk to accept her resignation. Oh, I'm sorry. We need sorry. to uh, accept her resignation of Kara McLaughlin, effective uh, June 26th. 26th. Effective June 26th. <coughs> I'll second that. Councilman Delango? Yes. Councilman Hitzelberger? With regret, yes. Councilwoman Doyle? Yes. Supervisor Prody? Yes. Now I would like to make a motion town clerk to authorize to advertise the position. I'll second that. Councilman Delango? Yes. Councilwoman Hitzelberger? Yes. Councilwoman Doyle? Yes. And Supervisor Prody? Yes. Okay, other matters. Um, we have we've, uh, received uh, approval from the DEC for the new playground. And um, you have in your packets um, the materials and the cost. I believe uh, the um, with the uh, approval of the DEC, with the DEC approval, um, there's, it has to be put in the newspaper for a week. You know, the um, verbiage that the DEC gave us in the approval. Uh, this is the current list of playground equipment that was chosen for the playground. $90,000 at one point. So 
So um, I think we should get it in as soon as possible. We have the summer camp starting yeah. the end of June. What do we need to move forward? So we have to make a motion to accept the $88,671? Yes. So I make the motion to accept the $88,671 for the purchase of the proposal from Park Attacks Playgrounds. Second. Councilman Delango? Yes. Councilman Hitzelberger? Yes. Councilman Doyle? Yes. Supervisor Priority? Yes. Also, other, under uh, other matters, I have um, EFC resolution for the project finance agreement. I have spent pretty much all week working with um, Special Counsel Kimberly Ray, Bond Counsel Douglas Goodfriend, Liz Roper's project manager for CT Mail, Linda Hannigan, our municipal CPA, reviewing the agreement, um, completing a required tax questionnaire. They've also sent uh, a set of tax exempt post issuance procedure guidelines that the town has to adopt eventually. Um, I went over, wanted to go over some of the numbers in the agreement because this is the agreement that has to go to EFC for, um, in order for us to borrow the money to, um, to pay for the old Amenia landfill. The total disbursement request to EFC as of May 28th are $2,016,221.45. That's the amount that EFC has paid to date of all the disbursement requests that have gone to them. Now, because of an EPA grant to EFC, EFC is granting the town principal forgiveness. In other words, this is an amount that the town does not have to pay back of $999,479. The principal payments, including the July payment that's due um, in the middle of July for $76,000, are a total of $139,565. So currently, as of May 28th, owed to EFC is $877,177.45. The anticipated expenses, which it will include the change order that we have tonight to finish up the landfill and close everything out are $193,782.55 to complete the project that's any construction costs, that's retainage that we have for the contractor. Uh, the total amount that, um, that's in the, in the um, PFA that we are going, actually going to be borrowing right now is $1,007,000. Now, the $2 million I was referring is under cost summary, page one of two. And on page B1 is the amount that, um, to be refinanced to date. That includes all of our principal payments and the principal forgiveness that we are going to get from um, EFC based on an EPA grant that was given to EFC. Now on page C1, available for um, C disbursement, the total construction costs were $5,693,498.68. The engineering costs were $1,909.34 98 And then there were associated fees for bond consul, local consul, special consul, and accounting and consulting services. Um, Two of the ones for our bond console for long-term and short-term were 
dollars, seventeen thousand seven hundred and twenty one dollars, twenty four thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars, fifteen thousand nine forty four forty, and one fifty three one hundred fifty three thousand eight hundred and ninety nine and five thousand um, dollars. Originally they had kind of a ridiculous amount in for contingency. They had like something <coughs> like over three hundred thousand dollars in it, but through discussions with um, Liz Rovers, the project manager, Linda Hannigan and our bond council, it was agreed that we didn't really need to borrow two hundred thousand dollars more than we needed to and that the seventy four thousand nine ninety nine ninety four would be adequate for contingency for the rest of the project. So the total of the project cost is seven million nine hundred and five six hundred and eighty two dollars. Um, less the DE, the DEC, the New York State DEC Environmental Quality Bond Act grant covers $75,000 of contracted construction and engineering costs. 75%, not 75 I'm sorry, 75%, which comes to $5,701,900. Less principal forgiveness, this is because of the EPA grant that EFC got, that the town is, does not have to pay back $999,479. And then the principal payments that we have made to date, 139565 The total of the project cost are $1,064,738. And then um, the closing costs are $5,323 and $899 for a total of $1,070,960. So right, uh, that is the expected amount that um, the town will be borrowing. And based on that, we have um, resolution number 16. Approving and authorizing signature of project finance agreement between the Town of Amenia and the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation for Amenia Landfill Remediation Project. At a meeting of the Town Board of the Town of Amenia held at the Amenia Town Hall on the 18th day of June 2015 at 7 p.m., Town Supervisor Victoria, Victoria Perotti called the meeting to order and I'll second make the motion. I'll second it. Move the following resolution to it. Whereas the town of Amenia previously entered into a contract with Sevison Environmental Services dated March 13, 2012 to perform certain remedial restruction, construction work at the Amenia Town Landfill located on Route 22 in the town of Amenia, the Amenia Landfill Project. Whereas the town's engineers of record on the remediation project, CT Mail Associates Engineers Survey Architecture and Landscape Architecture, PC, CT Mail, has performed remedial design and construction oversight for the project. Where, as said, remedial construction work at the Amenia Landfill project is nearing completion, but monitoring and maintenance will continue as required. Whereas pursuant to the state assistance contract with the New York State Department of Environmental Conversation, the EC is providing funding for 75% of the eligible engineering and construction costs of the Amenia Landfill Project, and the town is responsible for 25% of the cost of the project. Whereas the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation, EFC, has prepared and provided the agreement between the town and EFC under a leveraged finance program whereby the Amenia Landfill Project will be included in the EFC SRF bond issue scheduled to close on or about August 30th, 2015, a copy of which agreement is attached here to. Whereas EFC has advised the town that to meet the financing schedule, the agreement must be signed, returned to EFC no later than June 23rd, 2015, whereas the town board has determined that the financing provided by the agreement is advantageous to the town in paying for the Amenia landfill project, whereas the town board has determined it is in the best interest of the town to approve the agreement 
and authorize the town supervisor to sign the same. Well, therefore, it is hereby resolved that the town board approves the agreement and authorizes the town supervisor to sign the same in the form attached on behalf of the town. Supervisor Prody? Yes. Councilwoman Doyle? Yes. Councilman Hitzelberger? Yes. Councilman Prody is absent and Councilman Delango? Yes. Also under um, other matters, we have a approval of a change order number seven um, to do some of the completion of the project, um, including stone fill at a culvert outlet and repair in an er erosion area on the south side of the West Down Chute. And um, they need to mow the vegetative cover in the landfill service in the, in the drainage wells in order to uh, encourage more grass growth. Resolution 17? Yes. Approval of change order number seven on Amenia Landfill Remediation Project. At a meeting of the town board of the town of Amenia held in Amenia Town Hall on the 18th day of June, 2015 at 7 p.m. Town Supervisor Victoria Frody called the meeting to order. I make that motion. I'm late second. Move the following resolution to it, whereas the town of Amenia Town has entered into a contract with Seven Sin Environmental Services. Seven Sin dated March 13, 2012, original contract to perform certain remedial construction work at the Amenia Town landfill located on Route 22 in the town Amenia Landfill Project. Whereas the town's engineer of record on the remediation project at CT Mail Associates Engineer Survey Architecture and Landscape Architecture PC which perform remedial design and is performing construction oversight for the project, whereas the original contract price for the services provided by Sevenson is $4,644,879.50, whereas as a result of previous change orders, the original contract price was increased to $5,593,498.68. And whereas CT Mail has presented the town board with change Order number seven issued on June 10, 2015, a copy of which is attached here to pertaining to additional work performed or to be performed by Sevenson. More significant items of which include and are summarized as the supply of all labor materials, equipment, and tools to install fine stone filling the specific the specified underlay upslope of the leading edge of the articulating concrete block on the east and west sides of the outlet of the culvert pipe under the entrance road, rating of disturbed areas, installation of topsoil and hydro seeding with base bid seed mix, minus white clover, all in accordance with specifications and change order number seven attached here to. Two, the supply of all labor materials, equipment and tools to repair the erosion area on the south side of the west down chute in accordance with the specifications and change order number seven attached here to. Three, the supply of all labor equipment and tools to mow the vegetative cover on the landfill service and in the drainage wells to mulch the grass that is being cut, all to be performed as more specifically detailed in change order number seven attached here, to, here to. Four, in accordance with the requirements of the contract documents, all wor work shall be guaranteed by the contractor until at least one year after the date final payment becomes due. Whereas said change order number seven sets forth certain particulars under the headings, necessity for change and why the change was not foreseen during original design as reasons, additional work is necessary by a seven cent, all as specifically set forth in the attached change order number seven. Whereas the requested net fee increase for the services contained in change order number seven is 34,193, 193 and 58 cents. Whereas the approval of change order number seven in addition to previously approved change orders would result in increase the original contract price to $5,727,692.26. Whereas pursuant to the state assistant contract with the New York State Department of Environmental Con Conservation, DEC, is providing the funding for 75% of the eligible engineering and construction costs on the Amenia Landfill Project whereas the town board believes that the additional cost contained in change order number seven will be eligible for funding under the state assistance contract with DEC, and the town will be responsible for 25% of the additional cost as a result of change order number seven. Whereas the DEC has approved 
change order number seven by email correspondence dated June 16, 2015, a copy of which is attached here too, whereas CT Mail has been advising the town board about the current status of the Amenia Landfill project and certain issues regarding the project's completion that have been encountered by CT Mail and Sevenson. Whereas after several consultations with the supervisor, town personnel, and the town's special environmental council, Kimberly Shayra of Westerville and Ray, LLP, CT Mail Associates has recommended approval of change order number seven to remedy several problems encountered in the completion of the Amenia Landfill project. And whereas the town board is relying upon the engineering ex expertise of CT Mail and its recommendation that change order number seven is vital to completion of the project. Whereas the town board has reviewed change order number seven along with the supporting documentation attached here too, and the approval email correspondence from DEC dated June 16, 2015. Whereas the town board based on the advice of its retained experts in reliance thereon, without an adoption of or agreement with any statements contained in the attached change order number seven as to the causes of issues encountered with a Mina landfill project, has determined that the additional services provided by or to be provided by seven sin and change order number seven are necessary in order to remedy the outstanding issues with the project to complete the remediation of a Mina landfill project. Whereas the town board has determined that it is in the best interest of the town to approve change order number seven to authorize the town supervisor to sign the same. Whereas the approval of a change order is a type two action under the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act and therefore is not subject to seeker review. I'll therefore is hereby resolved that the town board approves change order number seven from seven cent in the amount of $34,193.58. Is hereby further resolved that the town board hereby authorize the town supervisor to sign change order number seven and the form attached here too on behalf of the town. Uh, let me just ask, my copy doesn't have a copy of the um, DEC approval Scott Diet's email, which I had sent over. Um, so I have an extra copy of it here. If you can okay. use that for the resolution. It was sent by email. Can I make that motion? No motion. For reading. Is a okay. Supervisor Prody? Yes. Councilman Doyle? Yes. Councilman Hitzelberger? No. Councilman Delango? Yes. And Councilman Brody is noted as absent. out the grant update um, we went to a workshop in New Paltz on the consolidated funding application process which is open now and um, there's a lot of grants for recreation trails and other projects that we may be interested in I um, you asked me to look into revenue projections for the kitchen and I spoke to uh, Rudy Eschbach extensively about the project and, kind of, and I did send you I believe uh, the proposal that I did for Tribute Gardens yes, I sent that I this morning um, we're basically trying to emphasize that this is a unique kitchen that would be a commercial kitchen for resale of prepared food to the public so it requires two you know agencies to regulate the, this including the Department of Agriculture and Markets and the Department of Health there's very few of these facilities in the area. I did research two that are up and running. There's one in Salem, New York, and there's another in Sullivan County. Um, just to get an idea of what they're charging. And um, 
I talked to Rudy about what would be realistic, considering right now they're paying $25 to rent the gym. So we thought $25 an hour to rent the kitchen would be a good starting point at least. It's up to you to decide the particulars of that, but just for revenue projections, we figured 25 an hour. We thought there are, there are six vendors of the 16 who are interested in using the kitchen. Um, and we estimated that- Do you have their names? Um, I, did, I didn't get the names, but I, you know, I will get that. I, what we're doing uh, too is we're gonna write um, a letter and have signatures so that people will be on the record that they are in support of this. I think that's important for all of the grant proposals to show community support for this because I've been hearing a lot of support, and I think there is, but we want to quantify the benefits, which really are um, the idea of having a facility that would enable the expansion of the farmer's market, because that is um, you know, a, a strong economic development potential for a rural town like Amina. The Sullivan County uh, Cooperative Extension saw this and just opened a new kitchen. They invested a lot of money, and they, um, I have a good contact with them. I've been talking to them. I have a lot of information that I've received about uh, commercial kitchens from them. They charge a um, hundred dollar annual fee, and then they charge twenty five dollars an hour to rent their kitchen up at the minimum of two hour space. Um, and they seem to be doing very well. And then the Batten Kill Farm has also an annual membership fee. They also require a $250 deposit to use the kitchen. They require proof of insurance, all those types of things that we would probably need anyway if we had a rental agreement. And then they um, charge businesses $100 for five hours, and they charge nonprofits $75 for five hours. If you wanted a kitchen for the whole day, it would be $170 for a business and 125 for a nonprofit. So those are different ranges and um, we have to, I, you know, I probably will talk further with the people at the farmer's market, but just to be conservative, if those six vendors all use the kitchen for a minimum of two hours uh, and we charge 25 an hour, that would generate on a conservative level, 7,800 a year in revenue. Uh, the goal is to have an expansion to 20 vendors, Rudy was saying, when they, we think that's possible, considering there's no other place like this and well, business- that's not counting a deposit if we decide. That's not counting that, any yeah, deposit or anything yeah, like that, that. That's just that the straight 25 an hour. Down. Yeah, for 320 hours of rental time, that's at 25 an hour, that's what that would yield. So we could talk about that, but 25 an hour seems like a reasonable rate. That's what Sullivan County um, Cornell Cooperative Extension charges, and even Battenkill charges about that, $100 for five hours, a little bit less than that. Um, so we thought 20 vendors, if you were to get 20 vendors, which is likely because it's not a facility like this, there's a farmer's market in Millbrook, there's one in, in Millerton, um, and he had said that this originally, there was a commercial kitchen in Dover, and it, um, they ended up moving to Poughkeepsie. So if there is a precedent for having this around here. Um, Why did they move to Poughkeepsie? Just a bigger operation, I guess. Now, is this kitchen big enough to handle 20 vendors? I, oh, yeah. I mean, You're talking a six burner stove with three, up, three bay oven? Well, it would be an operation during you know, normal business hours, let's say. And right now, with those six vendors, that's only um, 12 hours every other week. I think there would be time. I, and we were talking about this too, something that you have to decide or we have to talk about is what would the predominant use of this kitchen be? Would it be a commercial kitchen? And we were thinking, yes, that really is probably the main purpose of this, to help expand businesses in well, but to increase revenue for the town well right but also it would provide and also to enhance services of the town by being able to handle emergency situations it would be a teaching facility um and there was one other point um that he wanted me to make that that i'm it making in the community uh, use 
Yes, yeah, that we, we would have civic events that you could do here, more of, more things with Holiday of Lights, and also civic events honoring veterans. I wanted to put that in there because we did apply to Tribute Gardens, and we thought if we did get a grant from them, we probably could do more for veterans, because that is kind of their mission. I'm hoping that that will be successful. It would be a nice boost for us. And also, I, we have a proposal into Berkshire Taconic and M&T Bank. So um, there's a few others after going to that workshop in New Paltz that I think I could pursue as well, like Market New York. Um, I was also going to write a letter to our elected officials with this proposal. I think that would be a good next step and also develop letters of support from the farmer's market. So um, that's the gist of my conversation with Rudy. And we do, he was pointing out too that the town does already have 15,000 from the rec commission and the Silo Ridge donation was significant because um, it's a $30,000 value and apparently we could get some trade-in money for, even if we don't use the equipment so it sounds like that yeah. that is now a valuable it's being stored. pardon right now it's being stored well he wanted me to mention that that that's yeah. so that is a, we have like forty-five thousand in so the, the theoretical we're going to be able to trade in that silo whip yes and and get thirty thousand dollars yes the value of thirty thousand in equipment okay. that's what he was well in, in in equipment okay I mean, we're not going to get $30,000 for it. No, I, I, I understand. Yeah, no, but now the, the total cost to the kitchen is up to $107,220 now. That was the estimate, like a, with all contingencies in New York City. That was from, um, you know, the architect, well, Leo's firm. And it was maybe, you know, when you go out to bid, it may be less than that. But that's good to have a higher estimate. Uh, that does include a contingency. So yeah, I think that was that is a reason. I talked to Sullivan County, and that they invested quite a bit. That's a really nice kitchen they have. I want to. They did offer we could go and visit uh, if anyone was interested in seeing what they've done and why they did that, because it's similar to why you did it. They they're a rural community, and they saw the value. This is like value added for agriculture. So what town is that in? I'm not sure, I think it's Liberty, or at least the guy I'm talking to is based in Liberty, but uh, I'll find out where the kitchen is. They have a good website that has all the prices listed on it, and um, I just reached, I just heard back from him today, so I just wanted to do this, I know you wanted to know the revenue projection, and that's the absolute minimum. I think it would be more than that. In addition, if we get some of these grants, hopefully, for at least half of the anticipated cost. And the other, um, the only other thing that, you know, was the um, consolidated funding workshop that I attended in New Paltz and um, just working on. Well, they had a trail, um, trails Grant. Recreation trails grant yeah. is a possibility we we're thinking because we do need more money for the trail to the train. the train. That could also be really a priority project for the region if we wanted to. They are looking for projects that are... Well, yeah, you said projects that are already approved by right. the uh, DOT, which this one is. So we need to sit down and look at that because it has to be in by July 31st. Right. Do you have any other questions? Or? No, I just want to say that for the the rental price for the kitchen, we we are as we go through the project process, we'll be looking at the cost of actually running the kitchen and the maintenance of the kitchen that we have to put out. I can't see how we should rent it out for. I'm just going to arbitrarily say ten dollars an hour if it's costing us fifty dollars an hour to have it open during that time. So that's one of the things that um, we will need to balance when we look at the uh, actual rental price. I would like to send you an article I found in the New York Times that talked about this. There was a woman Please in Brooklyn. Please do. Yeah, it was very interesting. This woman in Brooklyn had a small uh, cookie making business and she was doing it at home and then she um, 
set, tried to set up a commercial kitchen with her friend in Brooklyn, and they did um, manage to get it off the ground, but for the first few years it was running in a deficit. Um, they were getting 25000 in rental income, but it was costing 35000 But finally this year they turned the corner and are um, out of the, the red. I just thought it was an interesting article, and it mentioned someone from Dutchess County, too, who's an expert in commercial kitchens. Um, so I'll forward that to you, because I thought it was relevant to this, that it is kind of a long-term project. You're not going to see an immediate turnaround, and it probably will cost you, but it is a service that seems to be needed, if, especially if, you know for the emergency aspects. Well, like I've been saying, yeah, for the... Uh civic events and emergency a aspects definitely it would you know you you operate at a loss for that but as for a paid service somebody's coming in and renting the property that well, should that's be paid why, yeah, for in this um, rental agreement we could have something like having a deposit and they would have to have insurance and you know we'd have to think about all of that but yeah. they, a lot of it is already you know, been thought through by Sullivan County and some of these other places, so I'll, you know, send that information to you. Yeah, if you could send that to all of us, that would be great. All right. Okay? All right, thanks. Thank you. Town board comments? I have the draft of the new look for the front page, if you guys want to I was trying to pull it up on my iPad so I could show you while we were all in here, but I'm not getting a good signal in here. So um, if you all want to step out in the hallway and take a look, I can. Look at the website? Is that what you said? Yeah, the, the two oh. column oh, okay. thing. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's ready, ready, ready for go. viewing. Well, um, see, if you don't have time to do it tonight, I could take a screenshot and email it to everybody oh, if that's easier. CAC wanted to thank you also for all the work you did putting those photos up. There were a lot of them, and they said you worked really hard on that. So thank you. Well, they're welcome. I, I think they're, the photos are really fabulous. Yeah. And I, I ended up with a day of having to talk to people on the phone all day long. So I was typing <laughs> while talking. It worked out perfectly, I think. Thank you. It's really interesting. I would also say thank you to Victoria because I she went away in early May and left me in charge and I got a ton of emails every day relating <laughs> to page C1 of this multi-page um, state water. She stepped us through it, but it is voluminous and all of these numbers that she carefully read to us are from years and years and years of costs going back to my case and you know all of these numbers had to be exact and they kept going back and forth and back and forth between the bookkeeper and is this the right number and I was my head was spinning I would see it at the end of the day and I'd say I don't know but the decision has to be made in the day and I just couldn't wait for Victoria to come back and <laughs> <laughs> this is not light stuff. I, when she says she spent the week doing it, you may not have heard that very clearly. She spent the week doing this and making sure that those numbers were right because once we lock in for financing, that's that. She's doing this for the long haul. It's been a long, long haul on this and I feel like we've just made this incredible turn down the last uh, the home stretch. We're on the home stretch with this, and it's going to be a beautiful park, but um, it didn't happen just by accident. So I appreciate all of the details, not just you, but Bill Flood, and uh, this started really with Arlene and, and uh, Janet and all of the people who worked so hard so many years on that. Thank you for um, doing what you had to do to make that all come together. Oh, there's a lot of things. I, I you know, I, I got a call or um, a, a request from Indian Rock Schoolhouse to um, ask if there was any civic need or um, special purpose that we could find for the trees that have been planted at, over the years at Indian Rock Schoolhouse as part of their Arbor Day program. 
the trees have grown up and they're now six feet tall and they need to be thinned. Um, I reached out to a few people and they said the problem is digging and balling and transporting them into a new location is very difficult. Um, reached out to a few more people who confirmed yes it's digging and <laughs> finding the equipment to transport those carefully and that our season was closing for this year. So uh, I did talk to Ian Holbeck because he's beautifying our little stretch in South Amenia Road um, with trees and planting them along there very nicely. Um, he said he doesn't, he also had the problem of digging and balling. So he said an alternative would be to cut down a few of these trees, which we used to do uh, and put them in the hamlet to decorate as part of our Christmas celebration. So yes, we would have to cut them, but you know, you know they would at least be utilized in a Christmassy um, celebration. So I had said that in the past we had paid for trees at Adams and they were little six foot trees. I haven't looked at these trees, but they're evergreens and um, it's a thought. So I said I would share it with you if you wanted to um, pass it along to the Enhancement Committee and have them discuss it, think about you know, whether or not that would be appropriate. Be nice to have them lit in both the hamlet of Wasaic. We could see them supported along the base of the historic lamppost um, as a possibility if they don't fit into the barrels. But how does the rest of the board feel about this uh, potential use of trees? I will defer to people who know more about trees than I do. <laughs> Should I uh, defer it to the Enhancement Committee? I think so. So that would be fine. There are many questions that we have to look at for enhancement, and we'll just include that as part of our thoughts, especially for Christmas celebrations. Um, those were my main things. Just, you know, I've had, like I said, Noise ordinances seems to be the issue for uh, the summer, and if people can just be courteous of their neighbors, that would go a long way. Thank you. I just want to remind people that the uh, Southern Berkshire Amateur Radio uh, event is taking place. Um, starts at 2 o'clock on the 27th, goes overnight to 12 o'clock noon on Sunday the 28th. That'll be held over on Mechanic Street um, by the fire department. And uh, it's a lot of fun. They get, you can listen to the radio and, and try and reach out and uh, talk to somebody across the, across the other side of the world. Uh, when it gets really late at night, uh, the signal goes further. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, the gentlemen are there and they explain everything. I've been going for a few years and have a great time every time I go. So um, please do stop by 2 o'clock Saturday the 27th through 12 noon Sunday the 28th. Is there any other town board comment? We need to do an executive session. We make a motion to come out of regular meeting, go into an executive session. Can we invite the town clerk in? Yes. I'll second that. Councilman Delango? Yes. Councilman Hitzelberger? Yes. Councilwoman Doyle? Yes. And Supervisor Ferdy? Yes. Good night. Take it easy.